Welcome to section 5 of endocrinology. In this section, I will be discussing insulin and glucagon. So let's get started. Insulin is the major anabolic hormone of the body. It acts at the cellular level by increasing lipogenesis, glycolysis, and protein synthesis. Essentially, insulin tells the body that there's enough glucose in the blood, so the body responds by building up fat stores, breaking down the glucose for energy, and constructing necessary proteins for normal cellular processes. So what effect does insulin have on free fatty acid concentrations in the serum? Insulin normally increases lipogenesis by taking free fatty acids from the blood and making triglycerides with an adipose tissue. This allows the body to store fat and use it at a later time when the body needs energy. So in the presence of insulin, the free fatty acid concentrations in the serum would be low. Insulin also works by increasing the cellular uptake of potassium, which will be important when we discuss diabetic ketoacidosis. And finally, insulin translocates GLUT4 vesicles from the cytoplasm to the cell surface, which allows cells to rapidly absorb glucose. So in this way, insulin causes blood glucose levels to decrease. Let me draw this out to make things clear. This is a skeletal muscle cell, and this is the insulin receptor. And when insulin binds to the insulin receptor, it causes tyrosine phosphorylation. After a series of steps, this results in GLUT4 vesicles within the cytosol to move to the cell surface. So G4 for GLUT4 causes these to move to the cell surface. And here, the GLUT4 channels allow the rapid absorption of glucose. Aside from insulin, what else increases the translocation of GLUT4 vesicles to the cell surface? Exercise. This is an important insulin-independent way of lowering blood sugar, and it's actually incredibly effective at preventing and treating diabetes. Insulin is synthesized by beta cells of the pancreas. Within these cells, there are several steps before the final product insulin is made. First, preproinsulin is made in the endoplasmic reticulum, or ER. This is taken from the ER and packaged into vesicles as proinsulin. Proinsulin is then cleaved into C peptide and insulin and secreted into the blood together. Let's draw this out on the next slide. So this is a beta cell within the pancreas. Preproinsulin is made in the endoplasmic reticulum. Preproinsulin. And this is the endoplasmic reticulum. And this is taken from the ER and packaged into vesicles. As a vesicle. As proinsulin. Proinsulin is then cleaved into C peptide and insulin and secreted into the blood. C peptide and insulin. Okay, let's go through a few examples to solidify these concepts. Imagine a 12-year-old boy comes to the emergency department with symptoms of hypoglycemia. As the attending, you're unsure if the boy has developed an insulinoma, which is just a tumor that secretes insulin, or if he's abusing his sister's insulin, who happens to be a type 1 diabetic. So how could you distinguish between the two? Well, if you understand how insulin is synthesized, then you can figure this out. During the final step of insulin synthesis, insulin and C-peptide are released into the blood in equal concentrations, as I've drawn here. This makes C-peptide a useful molecule because it allows you to compare the concentration of C-peptide to insulin. If the boy has a tumor that is secreting insulin, then the same synthetic pathway we've drawn out here applies, and he would have high C-peptide and high insulin. If he has been abusing insulin, then the endogenous insulin will be low. And as a result, the C-peptide will also be low. So in abuse, you'd expect to see high exogenous insulin and low C-peptide. In a tumor, you'd expect to see high insulin and high C-peptide. I've included this picture to show you that insulin is secreted from the beta cells, which is at the center of the pancreatic islet and glucagon is secreted from the alpha cells, which are at the periphery of the pancreatic islet. 
Just like all hormones, insulin is tightly regulated through a negative feedback system. In the case of insulin, this tight regulation is determined by concentrations of blood glucose. Insulin normally lowers blood glucose, so it makes sense that insulin is secreted in response to elevated blood glucose levels. This is a pancreatic beta cell, and on the cell surface, there are insulin-independent GLUT2 channels, which allow glucose to enter the cell. As glucose enters the cell, it is converted from glucose to glucose 6-phosphate, G6P, by the enzyme glucokinase. It's then broken down by the glycolytic pathway, and as a result, the ATP concentrations rise. There are also ATP-sensitive potassium channels, draw these over here, which are inhibited as ATP concentrations rise. So the potassium channels are inhibited, and positively charged potassium begins to accumulate within the cell, causing it to depolarize. And depolarization results in voltage-gated calcium channels to open. So Ca2 plus for calcium, calcium begins to rush in. As calcium accumulates, it causes exocytosis of insulin, John I there for insulin, and C there for C peptide. So it causes exocytosis of insulin and C peptide vesicles, which are just prepackaged and ready to be released into the blood. Okay, let's go over a few examples. How would decreased expression or function of the enzyme glucokinase affect blood glucose levels? Glucokinase is normally not very active until glucose concentrations become high. For all you biochemistry gurus, this is just another way of saying glucokinase has a high Km. And this makes sense. You don't want to be secreting buckets of insulin unless blood glucose concentrations are elevated. Otherwise, you'd easily become hypoglycemic and pass out. Or so in the case of a glucokinase problem, blood glucose levels would have to be even higher the normal in order to trigger the activation of glucokinase. For example, if glucokinase is normally activated when blood sugar levels reach 100, then in the case of a glucokinase problem, blood sugar levels would have to be 130. This idea is actually a genetic condition called maturity onset diabetes of the young, or MODI. And it's actually pretty high yield for step one. Okay, here's a pharmacological tie-in. What drug used to treat type 2 diabetes acts by inhibiting the potassium channels? Sulfonylureas. I'll write that out for you guys. Sulfonylureas. This includes drugs like chlorpropamide and glipizide. By inhibiting the potassium channel, these drugs trigger depolarization and the release of insulin, which can then lower blood glucose levels. Incretins like glucagon-like peptide 1 or GLP-1 and dipeptidyl peptidase 4 or DPP4 are hormones that control the release of insulin. And drugs that modulate incretins can be useful in treating diabetes. GLP1 normally stimulates the release of insulin, and DPP4 blocks GLP1. So pharmacologically, we could increase the release of insulin by either increasing GLP1 or by blocking DPP4. Can you think of drugs that block DPP4? Citagliptin, or other drugs that have the suffix gliptin, are all DPP4 inhibitors. Okay, what about a drug that is a, an analog to GLP1? Liraglutide or exenatide. These are both GLP1 analogs and have the suffix tide. Okay, moving on to glucagon. Glucagon is basically the antagonist to insulin. It's the major catabolic hormone of the body. Essentially, glucagon tells the body that, that there isn't enough glucose in the blood, so the body responds by breaking down fat stores and causing the liver to exhaust its glycogen stores and then churn out glucose through the gluconeogenic pathway. This hormone tells your body you're starving. So this is adipose tissue, and this is the liver. Glucagon upregulates the enzyme hormone-sensitive lipase, and that's present in adipose tissue. 
which causes triglycerides to break down into free fatty acids and glycerol, which can then be released into the blood, travel to the liver, and be converted into ketones. Ketones can then be converted to acetyl-CoA and metabolized for ATP in the brain when glucose gets low. So going back to your text, glucagon increases glycogenolysis, gluconeogenesis, and lipolysis, and it acts on the hormone, hormone-sensitive lipase, and this is within adipose tissue, which facilitates the mobilization of fat. As I showed earlier, glucagon is synthesized by alpha cells of the pancreas. And unlike insulin, glucagon is secreted when blood glucose concentrations get low or in response to hypoglycemia. Additionally, glucagon upregulates the enzyme glycogen phosphorylase in skeletal muscle and hepatic tissues. Okay, now I'd like to take a second to map out the cellular enzymes involved in glycogen synthesis and breakdown. This is a hepatic cell, and this is the glucagon receptor, and this is the insulin receptor. When glucagon binds the glucagon receptor, a second messenger system is activated. This is adenylate cyclase, which converts ATP to cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP then activates several other enzymes, which ultimately will activate glycogen phosphorylase. Glycogen phosphorylase breaks down glycogen into glucose. When insulin binds the insulin receptor, it causes tyrosine kinase phosphorylation, which then upregulates the enzyme protein phosphatase. And protein phosphatase upregulates glycogen synthase, which converts glucose to glycogen. And memorizing the different enzymes and pathways here is very important for step one. So in review, glycolysis occurs when the body has sufficient energy, and this is in response to insulin. And during periods of fasting or starvation, glucagon is the predominant hormone in the body, and it causes hepatic glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis. And this starts to occur several hours after the last meal. Do you know what other organ in addition to the liver participates in gluconeogenesis? The kidney. A day after the last meal, lipolysis and ketone production begins to kick in. And finally, proteolysis occurs after about a week of fasting. If nutrition continues to be withheld, then massive proteolysis will eventually result in death. Understanding that what metabolic pathway predominates at what time during starvation is important in high yield for step one.